You are listening to the CMC Podcast. Join us each week for messages designed to equip, inspire, and motivate. And now for today's message from Pastor Paul Kern. Well, I'm excited about um, what I have to share with you today. I think what I have for all of us is a really important topic. Um, You know, the Bible's full of promises. Awesome, awesome promises for us. There's the promise of eternal life. Amen. It's a great one. There's the promise of forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus. There's the promise of the Holy Spirit, like Eric was talking about this morning on the stage, encouraging us to listen and walk in Him every single day. There's the promise of future rewards that God has for all of us as we work and serve and do what He's called us to do. But, but you know, there's, there's one thing in the Bible that wasn't promised to us, and that's a life free of pain. <laughs> you know, I wish it was, um, but it's not. None of us have been promised a life free of pain. We all experience pain at different levels, at different times in our life. And, and I want to talk about that today. You know, I, I think it's easy to tiptoe around the topic of pain uh, in church. I think that's something that some people would like to avoid or we just pretend like it, it doesn't happen. But the fact of the matter is, all of us are going to walk through seasons of pain. And I say seasons because pain doesn't last forever. There, but there are seasons of pain that we all will have to walk through. There will be crushing heartbreak. There'll be physical pain that you will have to walk through, emotional pain, even spiritual battles that you will face. Nobody's exempt from it. Nobody, nobody comes to a place um, in their walk with the Lord that you arrive at some spiritual plateau that all of a sudden you transcend above experiencing pain in your life. Once again, I, I, I wish we did, but we just simply don't because we live in a fallen, broken world that ultimately is going to be made right when Christ returns. But in the meantime, we live in it every day. And I, I've walked through many painful seasons that weren't even of my own making. Now, there's been some that were of my own making, and we can all identify with that, right? You know, like, mm, you know, why did I say that? Why did I do that? You know, things that I did before I knew Christ out of just stupidity and wisdom and just being led by my flesh brought a lot of pain. And you guys have heard me talk about that. Now, I don't, I don't share a lot of my embarrassing moments, and I have many, many of them because I don't want you to have those as tools to use against me at any time, so that's all going to remain a secret uh, in my life. But, but, you know, we all walk through seasons of pain, and, and a lot of those aren't of our own making. A lot of hardships that I've walked through have been because they were placed upon me, not because I made anything uh, or did anything to cause those to happen. It may be the pain of a divorce uh, for you. It could be the betrayal of a friend or, or maybe a coworker or maybe a partner that you partner with in business. It, it could be the betrayal of a friend, the hurtful words that uh, parents spoke over you growing up or maybe friends teasing you in school. Or it could be levels of pain that are even much greater than that, like a loss of a person in your life who died that you loved so very much. Angela and I, uh, five years ago, we walked through a real, real difficult season of pain in our own personal life when we lost our 20-year-old son, Clark, to a disease that he had fought for many years in his life. And, you know, that was a, a very difficult season for us. And then just four months later, uh, I lost my mother right after that. So, you know, a, a very difficult time. And there were a lot of other elements and things that were going on that even compounded the difficulty of those circumstances uh, in our life at that time. Fifteen years prior, I lost my father to cancer. So, so we've literally looked our greatest fear in the face and walked through it. Now, those weren't just minor disappointments that we faced. I'm not talking about minor disappointments. We, we all have to navigate that, and we all have to deal with that. But, but I'm talking about seasons of unbelievable difficulty, things that you don't even know if you're going to be able to come out on the other side. 
and be a normal individual. You know, we were wondering if we were going to be able to come out on the other side of this and continue leading like we were leading here in our ministry and and our church. And, you know, we just can't lose sight of the fact that real people with real problems are all around us. And even your leaders in church, church staff face problems and difficulty. Like I said, nobody's exempt from it. You know, I think sometimes it's easy when you see some spiritual leader, you you know, standing up on the stage preaching and ministering the Word. Sometimes it's easy for you to think, well, boy, they just don't understand my problems. They can't relate to the difference. It's easy for them to say that. No, it's really not true. We all get up the same way every day. We all wake up. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. The same blood that flows through your veins flows through your leadership's veins. And and honestly, guys, I can't remember a a time in my 30-plus years of ministry that I wasn't experiencing some level of pain in some degree or some form of another. Pain's relative. You know, you don't compare your pain to somebody else's pain or somebody else's pain to your pain. Pain is relative to the person and what they're walking through. You know, I think sometimes as parents, we make the mistake with our children or with younger people of saying, you know, well, you know, that's, that's not a big deal. You know, that's just spilt milk. But, but to them, pain is relative. You know, where they are at in their life and, and what level of maturity that they're at in their life, that pain is real. That pain is significant to them. And, you know, we have the responsibility as parents and as leaders and as adults helping people navigate through that pain. Whether, whether that pain, uh, the response to that pain would be us saying, listen, life is hard, suck it up. You know, that, that, that's just what life is all about. But then there's other times where there's legitimate pain and they need ministry, and they need a hug, and they need to be loved, and it's important that we are sensitive to that. So pain is pain, and if you're alive for very long, you're going to experience it on some level, and there's a lot of people in this room today, you're walking through a season of pain right now in your own personal life, and maybe some people don't know about it, some people do, but the fact of the matter, we're all there. So instead of avoid it and tiptoe around it, you know, I, I want to take some of the things that I have learned over the last five or six years, over the last 30 plus years of being in the ministry, and I just want to unpack some of this and give it to you today because I think it can be helpful. And one thing that I would encourage you in is be real. Number one, be real with yourself, be honest with yourself, and be real with the people that are around you. It, it's, it's very, very important. Being vulnerable I think, and and authentic when you walk through difficult seasons in your life can be very encouraging to the people around you. You know, especially if you are in some form of leadership. Now, not that I think every leader ought to go around telling everybody about all their pain problems. No, there's a level of accountability that we all have, but I think for us to act like it's no big deal can sometimes leave people in a place of despair because maybe they feel like there's something wrong with them because, golly, they don't act like they ever have any problems. So when they see your humanity, it helps them connect with you. It helps them connect with your experience. It helps challenge them and grow them as a person. You know, even in the midst of our pain, Angela and I knew people were watching us. We had a lot of people in our ministry and outside of our ministry. You know, we've worked with hundreds and hundreds of young adults that have come through our ministry over the year. And, and, and seeing them seeing how we would respond and how we would connect with them and connect with people around us, how we would do everyday life had a huge impact upon how they would face pain in their own life, that they were bound to encounter at some point in time. I I just believe you're going to teach so much more through example, through the issues that you walk through in life than you ever would in a classroom or in a Sunday school or in a connect group or whatever it may be that that, that you're you're doing. See, and and, and let me balance this by by saying this. When, When we walk through this season in our own personal life, we certainly sense the responsibility 
that we had as leaders in our church to still lead our staff and lead our people that were here in our church at that time. So for me to unload all of my personal problems and all of you know, our personal pain upon everybody around us would not be the right thing to do. But at the same time, for us to keep all of that to ourselves, and sometimes people call that, you know, privacy. But listen, There's a big difference between privacy and secrecy. So let's talk about what that looks like, privacy and, and secrecy. When you're hurting, people are going to sense that there's hurt there. They're gonna they're gonna know. Now, you may be good at hiding it, but for the most part, people are pretty aware. You know, there, there are some people that aren't. They just are, are kind of oblivious, and that's, and that's fine. That may not be their personality or makeup, but there's always going to be people around you when you're walking through seasons of pain. They're going to be aware that there's hurt there, and if you don't give them the appropriate amount of information, they're left vulnerable to assumptions that will cause them to draw conclusions, Sometimes those conclusions are not going to be accurate because they haven't been given enough information from you to be able to draw a proper conclusion about what's going on. And so that's why I'm saying there's a difference between privacy and secrecy as you walk through seasons of pain. And and that secrecy, it can erode relationships. You know, if you withhold something, because it's important that we understand we are the body of Christ, amen? You know, you, you, if you are on the job and you hit your finger with a hammer, your whole body is going to experience the effects of that hammer that hit your pinky only, right? How many of y'all ever stumped your small, your pinky toe? I'm talking, it is the worst, it's the worst. My family has laughed at me. I mean, I literally, I think I broke mine one time. My whole family's laughing at me. I'm rolling in the floor, and it's just, it's terrible. It's painful. See, my wife's laughing at me right now. It's still not funny. It hurt. But it affected my whole body. It, just, it didn't just affect my toe. And so we're the body of Christ. And so when, when people within our church are hurting, we all experience that hurt with them, and the health of your relationships can erode real quick, quickly when they're trying to come up with an answer or resolve an issue or a problem with little or no information. So it's important that we help them there. Now, Angela and I were hurting, and there were people around us that could sense that. People can sense that about you, too. Even though you think you may be good at hiding it, people can still sense that about you. So it's better for you to share appropriate information with people in truth instead of letting that circulate around the rumor mill. Because if you let it circulate around the rumor mill, it's liable to get turned into something that it's not at all. Maybe they recognize something's going on in your life and you're hurting, but because they don't have enough information to come to a proper conclusion about that, they may think that there's, you don't like them. They may think that there's you know, issues in your life that really aren't accurate issues. There may be some, something going on that's really not accurate. So I encouraged our ministry team that, you know, I knew we had a lot of great people here, competent leaders that could step up during that time, and they could fill in the gaps where we weren't able to fill in those gaps during that season that we walked through. And one important thing to remember is that people's curiosity has an extreme appetite. We all have it. We have an extreme appetite. We're very curious at what's going on in people's lives. And because of this, if we give them too many details, and I'm on the opposite side now, if we give them too many details, it will satisfy their curiosity, but it could diminish their stability. Because maybe they're not in a position that they can handle the burden 
of the pain that you're walking through at that time in their life. For example, if you're a parent in the room today and you have young children, your, your young child is not your confidant. That, that's not the person that you unpack and unload all of your hurts and your pains. You know, I remember when I was growing up and, and, you know, my parents were married for 33 years, but, you know, the majority of those years was a lot of turmoil in their marriage. And my parents would often stick us kids in the middle my dad, you know, he would have conversations with me about my mother and how she wasn't meeting his needs. And my mom would have conversations about my dad and how he was being rude and ugly and cruel to her. And, and here I am, a child in the middle, and I am a child. I'm not able to, to carry the load of the burden of that pain that is being unpacked on me. So we have to be very careful about how we go about talking to people about the pain that we're walking through. See, some people love you so very, very much, and they want to know what it is that you're going through because they love you, but they can't bear the heavy burden of what you're walking through. They're not mature enough in the faith to carry that. So, for example, there were staff members that I gave more information to than I did other staff members, depending upon where they are, you know, possibly even age-wise. You know, I didn't go to our interns that come through our Applied Life Leaders Academy who are 18 to 25. I didn't sit down and have conversations with them and unload all of my emotional struggles, all of my confusion, all of the battles that I had going on in my heart and my mind because what I would have done, I would have satisfied their curiosity, but I would have produced real instability in their life. And I could have even possibly caused them to fall away from the Lord because they weren't in a place where they could handle that. Can you understand what I'm saying? And all the rest of you, you know, you just, you just ask those people to be praying for you. That's all you have to do. Yeah, we're walking through a hard time. We're dealing with some difficult things. Please, please be praying for us. Now, another area that, that I won't want to talk to you about, and this doesn't necessarily have to do necessarily with loss, but it does have to do with pain. And one area of pain that is significant and real for all of us is the pain of criticism. Criticism. It's not if you will be criticized, it's when and how often you will be criticized. And, and I think one area that we battle with is just the pressure to be perfect during that time. You know, I think we all fall under the pressure when we're walking through difficult seasons or when we're going through things is we feel this pressure to be these perfect people. We feel the pressure to appear as if we got it all together. We don't have any problems. Everything's great. And whether that pressure is self-imposed, do we just put it on ourselves? Or it could be from friends and family or coworkers or, or people in our life. You don't want to create a culture of perfectionism in your life. Why? Because you can't live up to it. Why? Because you're not perfect. There's only one who is. His name is Jesus. He's the only one who's perfect. All the rest of us are born into this broken world with a fallen nature. None of us are perfect. And you got to understand that what the enemy wants to do is he wants to use that to isolate us. That's the goal of the enemy. We all know we have an enemy. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes, to help me preach, to kill, help me, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that I might give you life, and that life will be more abundant. So we recognize that, that we have an enemy, and he wants to us to become isolated in our pain and in our problems. That's where he wants to take us because it's there in that isolation that he feeds our mind with dark, negative thoughts. And these dark, negative thoughts can take us to a place of even more isolation that can lead to us making some very bad decisions in our life. So, so one good question to ask yourself is this. 
Do I create an atmosphere around me that promotes trust and vulnerability? Or am I a person that has to put off this persona that I've got everything together all the time? You know, I'm just this perfect person and I don't have any of these, these problems. But is that being real? Is that being truthful? Is that being authentic with yourself or with the people that are around you? No, you know, let me take the pressure off of you right now. You are not perfect and you never will be. Now, that's not a negative. You know, I had somebody tell me one time, he said, Paul, life is hard, accept it. That set me free. It really did. Now, I've had some people, don't tell me that, that's awful. No, it was a great thing for me. When they said, Paul, life is hard, accept it. I went, okay, great, I get it. Life is hard. And the fact of the matter is, when I look at Christ on the cross, he was a perfect person who didn't do anything wrong and he died on a cross. That, that settled for me at all times that life was gonna be fair. It wasn't fair for Jesus and he did nothing wrong. So why should I expect it would be fair for me? So it just takes the pressure off of us to feel like that we have to be these, these perfect people. We have a responsibility to other people, but appearing to be a perfect person to them is not one of our responsibilities. It's just not. We're not ever going to be that. And I think when you or other people are experiencing pain, the thing that we have to ask ourselves, do they feel safe coming to you with their problems because they know that you are a real authentic person that will hear what they have to say. You won't pretend like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Your life is great and you got all these things going. Now, obviously, like I said, there are seasons of, seasons of pain. So there's going to be times in your life where you're not walking through necessarily a painful season. God's not going to have you in battle all the time. Even in war, there's seasons of peace. And so there's times that we are fighting spiritual battles and there's times that we're not fighting spiritual battles. You're not going to be in those all the time, but I think it's very important that we're able to talk to people about real problems, and then they're able to see that we're real people. Can I have an amen? Now, I alluded to this criticism, and I, I want to talk a little bit more about criticism and how to deal and navigate the, the pain of criticism because it's essential. It's just absolutely essential. Like I said, if it's, it's not if you will be criticized, it's, it's, it's how often and how much. And, and just know, you're going to face it. If, and especially if you're in a position of leadership, if you're a pastor or you're a teacher or you're a coach or you're a boss or you're a parent or you're a connect group leader, if you're in a position of leadership where you're leading people, you're a target. I mean, you're just going to be criticized. And as a matter of fact, I believe if you're not receiving some form or some amount of criticism as a leader, you're probably a fairly ineffective leader because you can't make everybody happy all the time. I mean, I don't know all the keys to success, but I certainly know one key to failure is trying to make everybody happy all the time. It's impossible. You can't do it. Now, I don't know why everybody wouldn't like me. I'm an awesome guy, but some people don't. I don't get it. I don't know why, but they just don't. I don't know why everybody doesn't like Josh. He's an awesome guy, but it's just, it's just the way it is. So here's what I've learned. And I think this, for those of you that are taking notes, because I know Eric mentioned that, and if you are, this is something really, really good to write down. The best time to forgive a critic is before you're ever criticized. I'm going to say that again because I should have got a better amen. The best time to forgive a critic is before you're ever criticized. See, you got to make a choice today to forgive the person that's going to criticize you tomorrow. You don't make that decision when you hit that crossroads. You got to already have made that decision about the kind of person that you are and the kind of person that you plan on being before you ever get to that point in your life. Can I have an amen?
Another important thing is, and this is a hard one to swallow, but some criticism you need to pay attention to because there's an aspect of criticism that can help you grow. I think one reason criticism hurts so much is because there's an element of truth to it sometimes. See, when people criticize us, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything that they're saying is accurate, but sometimes there's an element to what they're saying about us that pertains to our personality or our presentation or our approach or our response that bears some truth. And I think it's very important for all of us to be able to take that to dissect it, to look at it and say, okay, are there areas in my life that I need to change and I need to grow? Now, we don't need to allow criticism to control our lives, but we do need to be discerning concerning criticism. There may need to be some changes that you make in your life as a result of some criticism that you got as being the ball coach for the Little League team or, you know, when you led Sunday school for three weeks or when you made a decision at work as a boss with your employees or you made a call at home as a dad or as a mom with your family or whatever and you got criticism. You know, I I think there's there's ways that that we can grow in our communication and our approach and our response that can make us better people. So I, I guess what I'm saying, criticism is not a problem that you're trying to root out of your life. No, it's something you gotta learn to live with. It's just a part of life. And you, you can choose what you're going to do with that criticism and are you gonna allow that to grow you and make you a better person or are you gonna allow that to affect you in a negative way and make you bitter and closed off and isolated to people? The choice is up to you. But it's important to remember that oftentimes people criticize us out of a place of personal pain. We've all heard the statement, hurt people, hurt people. And I've been in situations where I was frustrated, where I was wounded, and I responded out of that place of frustration or out of that wound in a negative way, and it ended up hurting someone else. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that was my intention, although there have been times where it was my intention. Sometimes, though, it wasn't my intention. It just came out of a place of personal pain in my own life, or I saw that with other people that that came out of of a place of, of pain in their life. And so in that moment, I think it's very, very important that we recognize people and where they're at. Don't just look at the offense and get focused on the offense. You've got to look at the person, and you've got to be able to assess, okay, you know, what are they walking through? Possibly, what could they be facing? You know, I think especially for our young people in here, it's real easy to get mad at mom and dad. You know, they, they reacted a wrong way. And, and listen, once again, your mom and dad, they're not perfect people. But guess what? Neither are you. And they didn't go to college and get a degree and make an A-plus in parenting class. They're trying to figure it out just like you're trying to figure out life. Sometimes we hold people to these standards that's impossible for them to meet. Now, I'm, listen, young people, I'm not making excuses for your parents when they miss the mark because they do and they're going to. There's going to be times your dad, he's just too dang mean. And the Bible talks about that. There's going to be sometimes your mom, she's just too emotional and moody. And the Bible talks about that. But I think it's very important for you as a young adult and for all of us to be able to take into account, hold up, wait a minute, you know, maybe there's some unseen pressures. Maybe there's some unseen things that mom and dad are facing. Maybe there's some struggles that they had when they were growing up that they're still trying to work through and process that they haven't been able to get past that point yet or find healing in that area of their life yet. See, it, it just that place of empathy, amen? It's very important that we, that we walk in that. I believe some of our greatest moments are when people observe us and see us react the right way in a difficult situation. 
I know I've had lots of people, especially our interns, say to me, man, Paul, I don't know how you handled that way, handled that situation that way, but man, I want to be able to do that one day. And I said, well, it took years of practice. And it took getting it wrong until I got it right. Can I have an amen? See, how we choose to respond to criticism can challenge people. It can call them to a higher level as a human being, as a follower of Christ. Another area that I, that I think is very important for us, and, and this is something that I, I want to point out, to do more, you have to increase your pain threshold. I'm going to say that again. To do more, you have to increase your pain threshold. Now, as a pastor, I've had to bear the weight of some really difficult conversations. You know, Josh and Tim and I, we counsel people in our church, and we always want to be available to do that. We're, we're, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to help people. We want to be able to do that. But there have been conversations that I've been in uh, with married couples, with young people, with our, our CMA students and interns that have been a, a lot to bear and, and painful. And I've, I've gone home and just bawled my eyeballs out for people because it's hurtful to see people, whether that pain was thrust upon them for no reason of their own or they created a lot of that pain in their life through bad decisions and unwise choices in their own life. And the, the, the countless times that, that I've gone home upset. But the more influence and responsibility that you take on, the more pain you're going to have to learn to endure. You know, you young parents in here today, of young children, you're going to have to increase your pain threshold because nobody can hurt your feelings more than your little precious. Your little precious is going to get a little bit older, and then in their teen years, they're liable to say some things to you that are extremely hurtful. And they, they have forgotten all of the hours that you were up with them at night, nursing them and changing their diapers and taking care of them. And dad, you know, they're, in that moment, they're going to forget the sacrifices that you have made for them financially. The, the hours that you worked over to provide money for them to go to ball trips and youth group outings and to have a car and insurance and a phone and all these things, they're going to they're gonna let something come out. And, and I'm just telling you, the more influence and responsibility that you take on, the more pain you're going to have to learn to endure. And your inability <laughs> to handle pain will diminish your leadership influence. You have to be able to handle that, whether you're a boss, whether you're a young person coming up and, and you're getting older and you know, you're taking on some responsibilities, whoever you may be. Your inability to, to handle that pain will diminish your influence. It will diminish your growth. It will diminish your productivity. Now, what, one thing that I can say that as I look back on the, these past five or six years, and, and you know, we lived with that disease with our son for many, many more years than that and many, many surgeries and, and lot, lots of painful moments. But as I look back over those seasons and even dealing with my mother and my father with issues that, that they had, as I look back at that, that has made me more humble. It's made me more empathetic. It's made me more caring. It's made me more compassionate to people who are walking through similar things or have walked through similar things in their life. I'm telling you, when I see posts on Facebook from people in our church that are struggling. That hits hard. Not just, oh well, life goes on, I got stuff to do. No, see, those moments, they changed me. Now listen, pain is going to change you. You can't stop it, but you can determine how it changes you. And this is powerful. 
It's powerful. You are the one that decides if you will allow pain to grow you and draw you closer to the Father heart of God or you will allow that to make you bitter and angry and pointing your finger at God and turn your back on Him. It's your choice. God's not going to twist your arm. God's not going to make you love Him. God's not going to make you keep Him first place in your life when you have those seasons in your life that you, that you face. And, and a lot of times the difference between where you are and where you could be is the pain that you're unwilling to endure in between. You have to be willing to endure the pain in between where you are and where you want to be. And that's how you win. See, there's a pruning in your life. There's a pruning in my life. There's a pruning in your, a pruning in your life that, that is necessary to bring about new growth. And pruning is painful. It's never easy. But it's important and it's necessary for all of us. It can be the pain of, of, of a, a new lifestyle choice that you've made. You know, maybe you're changing your eating habits and the, your exercise plan. That, 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 that can be painful, the, the being sore from that. It may be enduring the pain of a new discipline in your life. It may be enduring the pain uh, and difficulty of an uncomfortable conversation that you have to have with your child or you have to have with your mate or a friend or a coworker. I've had to have some really uncomfortable conversations with people over the years. Not that I wanted to, but I knew I, I had to. I couldn't just let, because I, I love them. I couldn't just let that go. I love them too much just to ignore it or avoid it or put my personal feelings in front of what needed to happen. And so with CMA students, with our LA students, there's uncomfortable conversations that, that we've had to have. But once again, ultimately, that done in the right spirit and in the right way, not out of the flesh, but in the spirit, that done the right way brought new growth and changes in their life, and it made me a better leader in the long run because it taught me how to do a better job of communicating and dealing with that issue or problem as a leader. Can I have an amen? So if you're married, your mate may have to have a painful conversation with you or vice versa. These moments are never fun at all, but they're all a part of the growth process. But wouldn't you rather experience short-term pain of that conversation than you would the long-term pain of the consequences in that in your relationship with them had you not dealt with that? And that's why it's so important for us that we don't see pain as something that we try to avoid. Pain is not something that we try to avoid. Pain is a necessary part of life. As a matter of fact, without pain in life, we'd really be in a dangerous position. You know, there's a, there's a, a disease that's called SEPA, and it's, it's a very rare disease, and very few people get it, but basically, you're born with the inability to feel physical pain. And, and also, it, you don't sweat. You have no sweat glands. This is a very dangerous thing because, you know, the, the, the thing that makes a rock useful is also the very thing that gives it the potential to kill. The very thing that makes fire have the ability to warm you is also the thing that makes it very dangerous because it can burn you and harm you. You know, the, the rain that comes for a farmer is an answer to prayer, but it runs somebody else's day. But, but there was a little girl and she was born with this um, disease and she couldn't experience pain and boy, she had fallen and broken bones in her body on many occasions. As a matter of fact, she was on the playground when she was young playing and she jumped off a, 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 a piece of play equipment from really high up and she landed and she broke both of her, her femurs in her legs, the main, the main bones, and it's just terrible. Terrible what this little girl has had to experience because she can't feel pain. And they were asking her mother, 
you know, how have you handled this? How, how have you dealt with this? And she says, the one thing that I pray every night for my child, dear God, please let my child experience pain. Now, I don't know if we've really thought about it that way, but it's necessary in our lives. And if you're in a season of pain right now, I want to encourage you, stay positive. Keep a trusting attitude. Manage your emotional responses during that time in your life. You may not be able to do anything about what you're dealing right now, and maybe you didn't bring any of this on yourself, but you can choose to respond God's way and not out of your flesh. So important. So let me move into the last part of what I want to talk to you about. I want to give you a prescription today. Just a prescription for pain. Are y'all ready? This is, this is going to be good. So once again, let me just say, if you're not experiencing pain, it's not if, it's when. You will. You're going to. Hopefully right now you're not. But there may be a time that you will again soon. And the scripture warns us of pain. Nobody's exempt from it. We all face difficult seasons in life. We all have an adversary whose goal is to what? Kill, help me, steal and destroy. That's the enemy's goal. Don't forget you have an enemy. But we also have a savior and his goal to, is to give us life and life more abundant. As a matter of fact, Jesus warned us. He said, in this life, you will experience trouble. But then he said, but take heart, take courage, for I have overcome the world. He said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So we've been warned by Jesus that life has troubles, and Jesus faced them himself. Now, one of the ways that the enemy attacks us is by using guilt and condemnation and shame. This is one of his big tools that he uses, and we all have to fight this. The enemy will always provide a path of destruction for you when you're walking through a season of pain. But God will always provide a path of freedom and healing and wholeness for you as you're walking through a season of pain. And responding to pain in unhealthy ways is what the enemy will use to entrap us and ultimately try to destroy our lives. He'll use drugs. He'll use alcohol. He will use unwise reactions. He will use emotional responses. He may use emotional spending, toxic relationships, self-harm, isolation, the list goes on and on and on. Everybody reacts to pain differently. Everybody responds to pain differently. There's no right or wrong way responding to pain. As far as, you know, emotionally how you, it, it just, we're all different, okay? But there is a right and wrong way of responding to pain in how we process it, in how we deal with it in our lives. For example, a couple of extra glasses of wine in the evening to help us numb our pain. The abuse of prescription medication to help us escape our pain. Now, let me say this, guys. Now, and I want to be clear, because I, I, I'm not here to produce guilt and shame and condemnation in anybody. There may be a season that you need to be on an antidepressant. I'm not against medication. That's not a bad thing. You know, I take medication for my blood sugar. I take a, a ibuprofen every now and then when my knee hurts. So I, I'm not against medication. I'm not against counseling. I'm not against therapy. We counsel people in our church. You may need to see a therapist because of what you're walking through. There is no way that Angela and I would have been able to make it through that season in our life had it not been for certain people that God placed 
in our life. But abusing any of these things can be very dangerous. I want to warn you, never use any of those things to replace a deep, authentic relationship with Father God. Nobody can help you better than he can. You can take medication, but there's always going to be side effects to medication. But time spent with God, there will be no negative side effects there. There will only be positive side effects there. Now, once again, I'm not preaching against medication, and you may be on some today, and you, that's what you need to do, and I'm not saying go home and pour all your medicine out of the bottle, okay? You need to, you're going to need to pray that through and listen to the Holy Spirit and what He tells you to do. But like I said, you, you got to be careful. You know, when Angela and I went through those very challenging seasons, we had to learn to press into the Holy Spirit. That's what I had to learn to do. I personally meditated on Scripture a lot, a lot. I got in my Word and meditated on Scripture more than I had been doing, and I, I tend to meditate on Scripture a lot because I preach, and, you know, we got to have sermon material, right? Josh and Tim and I, we spend lots of times in our Bible, don't we, Josh? I mean, it's, it's daily, and reading books, it's just important. Now, I'm not saying that it would have been wrong for me to be on medication, but the first thing that I was determined to do was allow the Holy Spirit to fill me. Because of the situation that I've been in in my life and people that I've observed and wrong decisions that I've watched people make, I've seen people fall into the trap of becoming alcoholics and drug addicts because they use that instead of going to God first. And personally, I don't drink. I will never drink. I have no plans to drink. Now, am I saying it's a sin for you to drink? No, I'm not saying it's a sin for you to drink. But for me, that's not what I choose to do. With my family history, on both sides of my family, And what I have seen alcohol do in my family, I've just never seen anything good come from it, really at all. And so I choose not to do that. But I'm not condemning you if you do, but I am saying it's very important that you make sure that you are in a healthy connection with the Holy Spirit, because if you are, He'll help you navigate that, discern that, and make the choices for your life and empower you to make the decisions that you need to make. You know, just for me personally, and you can ask my wife, we've been married for 29 years today. I'm either all in or I'm all out. It don't matter what it is. And, 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 and you know, my all in will last a little while and then it'll go and then there'll be another all in. And then another all in. And some of you that have been around me for a while, you know what I'm talking about. That it's, it's a character flaw. Okay, but it's also a character strength because if I'm going to get behind you or I'm in it, buddy, I'm in it and I'm behind you. But I recognize because of that, I'm going to avoid certain things to try to meet needs in my life because of the dangers with my personality, right? So I think it's very important that we're students of ourselves that we know ourselves, that we pay attention to ourselves because we may have a good friend over here and and they can have a glass of wine or two at night with their meal. Or they can handle taking that prescription medication. That's not an issue for them. But is is that possibly could be an issue for you? So you got to determine where your line is and in the sand you draw it and you don't cross it to protect yourself. Are, y'all hearing, are you hearing my heart? Because I, I want to make sure that I'm not condemning or, or shaming anybody in here. That's definitely not my intention. Now, if God is not real during times of great distress in your life, then he's probably not real at all. It's easy for God to be real when the lights are down low and the air conditioning's on and the haze is in the room and the lights are going and the band is playing. But that can be an artificially 
induced state. See, when you know that it's real, is when it's real when nothing's going your way. When you don't have money for the latte, right? And you still follow God. When your car breaks down and you still follow God. When you've been praying for your mom to be healed and she's not, and you still follow God. When you've asked the Lord to move in a circumstance or a situation in your life and he hasn't done it yet, you still trust him. You keep praying. You keep that hopeful attitude. See, God is the source of our life. He's the need meter of our life. You know, a lot of scriptures that I meditated on during that season of my life, and I want to, as I close, I want to read a couple of them to you. Isaiah 43, one through three, do not be afraid for I have ransomed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, did y'all hear that? When? Not if. I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, did y'all hear that? Rivers. When? Not if. They're coming. You will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, did y'all hear that? Fire. When? Not if. You will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Philippians 4, 6, do not worry about anything, but listen, but in all things, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard him in, protect your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Psalms 145, 18 and 19, the Lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in your weakness. Come on. 1 Peter 5, 10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered for a little while. Everybody say a little while. Everybody say a little while. Everybody say a little while. Will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And lastly, Hebrews 4, 16. I'm just giving you some ammunition. It's a prescription. It's like going to the doctor and he writes it out. Here's my prescription for you right here. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But we have one who in every aspect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. See, he got victory. He's he's the conqueror. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. As I close today, I want our church, I want the people of Christian Ministries and all those listening on live stream and listening to our podcast, I want you to be able to successfully navigate seasons of pain. Sometimes we, you know, we, we have to suck it up. Sometimes we got to get tough. Sometimes we got to get a backbone of iron. We can't be cowards. That's what we got to do. We just got to say, you know what? I got to put my big boy pants on. Got to put my big girl pants on, as the lead pastor said. There are those seasons where we do that. But then there are those seasons where you can't. You just can't. You're going to have to have some help. And God's going to provide that help for you. He promises you. Like I said, the Bible's full of wonderful promises. And he provides that help for us in those times of greatest need. But whatever you're facing today, you don't have to face it alone. God has provision for you. Number one, he's there. His Holy Spirit there is there. His word is there. But he's also put people around you that are there. Don't isolate yourself. You connect with the proper people that you need. If you're here at Christian Ministries and you've been here for any amount of time, 
You need to be connected with people in this church and you need to be developing relationships with them because you need people. You can't live life without it. I mean, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. Come on. And finally, I want to end with this. This is just a truth that I live by. This too shall pass. It's not going to last forever. It feels like it is when you're in it. Feel like you'll never get out of it. But it'll pass. God is faithful, and you'll get through it. So what you've got to do is you've got to be like those disciples who got on that boat, and they were headed to the other side. And about halfway across, in the fourth hour of the night, they hit a terrible storm. Didn't think they were going to make it. Jesus was the one that told them to get in the boat and go, by the way. I think Josh talked about that. But they encountered Christ, and he got them to the other side. And, you know, my attitude has always been, you know, this is a pretty big storm. Must be something good waiting for me on the other side. Man, I got to get through this thing. You got to get through this thing. Because when you get to the other side, let me tell you something. The storm will be over. You will have gone through it. And your level of trust and your relationship with Jesus Christ will be so much stronger and so much deeper that you will be a completely different person. Then God will be able to use you to help other people who are going through similar things that you had to go through, and that's the way God meant life to work. Amen? Did y'all get something out of this? Stand with me this morning. We'll pray together. Father, we thank you. I thank all those that are listening on on live stream and by podcast, all those that are here with us. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, help us. Help us mature and help us grow. Help us to be sensitive to the needs around us as we navigate those seasons of pain, knowing that you're faithful to get us through and knowing, God, that nothing, nothing is wasted with you. Romans 8, 28, for we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Father, we thank you. Go before us this week. We'll give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless. You have been listening to the CMC podcast. For more information about CMC, our different conferences, Christian school, college internship, resources, and more, go to cmchurch.com.